You know that lake up at Ellesmere? Well, if you don't, you ought to get to know it, because it's really beautiful, covered in geese and swans, and there's even herons roosting up on the trees in the island. Well, some people would tell you that lake was made by the Great Ice Age. Sounds dramatic, doesn't it? But it's not true. It really isn't. The real story is about a little old lady, a little old lady called Mrs. Ellis, who used to live in a cottage there long, long ago, before there were rivers and streams and definitely lakes in Shropshire. Well, Mrs. Ellis, she lived in the cottage, as I say, and down at the bottom of the garden, she had a well, because there was no plumbing in the house. And from that well came the most wonderful water, Water that tasted like nothing else on earth. Well, that's not strictly true, because it did taste like something else on earth. Everyone's favourite food or drink. You say you like chocolate cake? Well, that water would taste like the best black forest gatto you've ever sunk your teeth into. And, well, if you like ice cream... I shouldn't mention brand names, should I? But it wouldn't be like walls or lions made. It would be like that stuff Ben and Jerry's make with the great big chocolatey fudgy lumps. Everyone loved Mrs Ellis's water and they'd come round to her place and they'd knock on her door and they'd say, Mrs Ellis, Mrs Ellis, can we come in? Can we try a little bit of your water? And she'd say, hang on a minute, my dears, hang on. And she'd leave them waiting at the doorstep while she went across the kitchen to the bureau and opened the drawer and got out a thimble and a long, long skein of string. And then she'd go back to the door, beckon with her finger and say, come along, my dears, come along, and take them down to the well. And when they were at the well... She'd tie that string around the neck of the thimble and then lower it very, very gently down the shaft until it just kissed the surface of the water. And then, even more carefully, she'd pull it right back up again to the top, not to drip a drop or drop a drip. And then she'd hand it over to them and they'd take that thimble full of water and they'd look at it with reverence and glee. And then they'd tip back their heads and tip that thimble and when that water touched their lips and their tongues they'd be transported off to a world of their favourite taste maybe strawberries and cream on women's finals day at Wimbledon maybe champagne or caviar or plain good old English tea but it would be their personal favourite they'd only be there for a moment of course and then they'd be back in this world Back in this world and gushing, gushing forth with praises, they turn to Mrs. Ellis and they say, Mrs. Ellis, Mrs. Ellis, you are such a kind, wonderful, generous woman, giving a taste of your most glorious water to us. I don't know how we can thank you enough. And she'd cross her arms and she'd look at them down her nose and she'd say, well, try a little bit harder then. And they would. They'd carry on praising her and flooding her with compliments. At the end, they'd all finish the same way. They'd say, Mrs Ellis, Mrs Ellis, can we come back and have another little taster of your wonderful water? Just one, just a little sip. And she'd say, you come back as often as you like, my dears. You just come back as often as you like. And the people up in the north of Shropshire, well, we're all hedonists, pleasure seekers to a man and woman, and those people in those days were no exception. They came back not once, not twice, not three or four times, but they came back six or seven times a day just for another little thimble full of Mrs Ellis's water. Well, that should be the end of the story, really, shouldn't it? Because everyone's living happily ever after, but they don't. And stories don't end that way. In the middle, they have a twist and a turn, and that leads you off to the ending. Twist and the turn in this story was the perfect summer, the one Michael Fish talks about on the weather forecast but can't remember which one it was. Well, I'll tell him which one. It was Mrs Ellis's summer. That sun came up on April the 1st, but it wasn't any April Fool's Day. This was the real McCoy. That sun stayed up in the sky all the way through to November wasn't even such a thing as night. The sun carried on blazing down, and everyone in Shropshire got a rare old tan, 
probably a little bit sunburn and sunstroke too, but they thought it was great to start with. But they were soon to find out it wasn't as good as they'd thought. They looked down into those green, pleasant valleys of Shropshire and saw no green at all, just brown, brown, parched earth. One by one, all the wells in Shropshire started to dry out. Every last one dried, but one. Can you guess whose? You're right, it was Mrs Ellis's well. That must have been magic, but it still carried on giving water. And the people, they flocked round to Mrs Ellis's house, with yokes over their shoulders and buckets hanging and clanging. And they were all saying, Mrs Ellis, Mrs Ellis, we'll just go and get a couple of buckets from your well, shall we? That's all we need, that'll last us the day. We'll just go and fetch them now, shall we? And she said, hang on one cotton-picking moment, you... If you want two buckets, then everyone will want two buckets and there'll be none left for me. I'm going to make her all. Little old ladies do that sort of thing. And her rule was, not a drop for you, not a drop for anyone. And that was that. It wasn't quite that, because the water carried on gushing up in the well and without all those thimblefuls coming out, it started to bank up right up to the brim and then to trickle over the brickwork down to the parched ground. She didn't change her mind. It was still not a drop for you, not a drop for anyone. And when the water covered her vegetable plot, just the same. She said, I've got all that black forest gatto and the strawberries and cream and all all manner of things in my larder. I'll be okay. And she went into her kitchen sat on a rocking chair, crick and crack, clickety-clack went her knitting needles and prrr went the cat. The only thing bothering her was the noise of the people with their buckets. She'd have to go to the door, fling open the door and shout over that pond that had once been her garden. Not a drop for you, not a drop for anyone. And then she'd come and sit down. But the water carried on bubbling up and the first she knew about it was the cat basket floating across the kitchen floor. She didn't change her mind. She upped with her rocking chair, a cat and her knitting, and she said, I've made her all. And she went up to her bedroom and made camp there. The only thing that bothered her when she was crick and crack on her rocking chair, clickety-clack with the knitting needles, and prrr went the cat, was the noise. She'd go over to the window and fling open the window and shout over that lake that had once been her back garden, Not a drop for you, not a drop for anyone. And she'd come back and sit down. Until she saw the chest of drawers bobbing up and down on the water because it had come up the stairs. She didn't change her mind still, though. She picked up a rocking chair, a cat and her knitting, and she shinned up the ladder, rung by rung, into that loft space above, under the roof. How she got that rocking chair through the hatch, we'll never know. But there she was in the attic room, crick and crack on a rocking chair, clickety-clack with her knitting needles, and prrr went the cat. Well, she wasn't bothered by the noise, because those people with their buckets were so far away over that magnificent mere that had once been her garden, she couldn't hear them. One thing she could hear, though, in time, was a change in the sound of the rocking chair, because instead of crick and crack, it was going splitch and splatch and splotch. And she looked down, and she felt her slippers, and they were saturated. They were soaking, they were sodden. And the water had started sucking up her stockings, almost siphoning up her stockings. And you know what little old ladies really hate? Well, if you don't, go out and find one and ask them. I'll tell you, whichever one it is, if it's a genuine old lady, she'll say the same thing. She'll say, the thing I hate most in all the world, young man or young woman, is wet knees. Well, it's true. You just ask them. And Mrs Ellis, in the story, she was no exception. She felt her knees and she said, Oh, I don't like that. That's horrible. Wet knees. Oh, I'm changing my mind. And she waded and paddled across the room to that tiny little window too small to get out of. And she stuck her head out, just like that. And she shouted at the top of her voice across the waters, Come on, get it! But did they take a drip or a drop? No. 
They couldn't hear a word because she was so far away over that magnificent mere. And the water carried on coming up, up and over. And it covered Mrs. Ellis. If you don't believe me, row out to the middle. Row out to the middle of that great big lake. Lean over, careful now. Put your ear above the lapping waters and listen. And you hear it. The click and the clack of her knitting needles. Because she's right down at the bottom of that lake, just a sitting and a knitting, with a very soggy moggy on her lap. That's Mrs. Ellis. It's Mrs. Ellis's mere. Or the local short net. They say that's Ellie's mere. Or Ellesmere, which is what we call it today.